Good morning. Welcome to worship here at our Savior's Lutheran Church. Good for us to be gathered either online or in person. Uh, those of you worshiping online with us today, we're glad you're here and hope you'll use the comments not just to say good morning to all of us, but as you see friends chiming in, certainly use the reply to comment back to them as well. Those of you that are here in person, we're glad you're here as well. Do me a favor, raise your right hand like this, shake it a little, now put it out in front of you. Now one person from each household, grab one of those attendance cards. I already know you have your hand out. Uh, we ask every time you're here for worship, we ask one per household. If you're a member, all you got to do is check the box and write your name. That is it, uh, right? But we put those and then the offering in the back on our way out. That helps us not just know you're here, but as we look at data, right, it helps us pay attention to who's missing so we can be good at being in community. So really helpful if you do that every time you're in worship. If your info has changed or you need to update it, that's a great way, simple way to do that as well. If you're new, uh, if this is your first time here, online or in person, we're so glad you're with us. All we ask for is your social security number, your checking routing number, and uh, maybe your driver's license number, and then we're good to go. No. Uh, just give us your name and your number. We wanna, we wanna reach out and invite you to fully be a part of this community of faith, as we're glad that you're here. I know some of you here uh, in person, this is not your normal service. We have our annual meeting right after this, and so you said, let me sleep in, and so we're glad you're here for our 1030 service. I'm Rob James, blessed to be one of your pastors, Pastor Scott Stolberg, Paula Mober, our director of worship and music, and Breathe, our worship band, will lead us. Everything you need is going to be on the screen, so we're going to tell you when to stand, sit, sing, pray, all that jazz. So right now, I invite you to stand as you're able as we begin with our call to worship. <clears throat> if we knock, God will open the door. If we, seek, we will knock. If we ask, God will give it to us.
We confess our sins before God and one another. Merciful God, Christ came into the world and showed us how to live, but we have failed to live by what he taught. We have not loved you with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength. We have not done to others as we would have done to ourselves. Shine a light on our hearts that we might turn from the shadows of our sin and walk in your ways. Jesus came not to condemn the world, but that the world might be saved through him. By his abundant love, all your sins are forgiven, that you might walk in the light of Christ. Amen. Okay. Uh, we pray. Righteous God, judgment belongs to you alone. Make us aware of our own limitations that we may act with compassion toward those who differ from us. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Please be seated. Our scripture reading today comes from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 7. Do not judge so that you may not be judged. For with the judgment you make, you will be judged. And the measure you give will be the measure you get. Why do you see the speck in your neighbor's eye, but do not notice the log in your own eye? Or how can you say to your neighbor, let me take the speck out of your eye while the log is in your own eye? You hypocrite, first take the log out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to take the speck out of your neighbor's eye. Do not give what is holy to dogs and do not throw your pearls before swine or they will trample them underfoot and turn and maul you. Ask and it will be given to you. Search and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened for you. For everyone who asks receives and everyone who searches finds and for everyone who knocks the door will be opened. Is there anyone among you who if your child asks for bread will give a stone? Or if the child asks for a fish will give a snake? If you then who are evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give good things to those who ask him? And everything do to others as you would have them do to you. For this is the law and the prophets. Enter through the narrow gate, for the gate is wide and the road is easy that leads to destruction, and there are many who take it. For the gate is narrow and the road is hard that leads to life, and there are few who find it. Everyone then who hears these words of mine and acts on them will be like a wise man who built his house on rock. The rain fell, the floods came, and the winds blew and beat on that house, but it did not fall because it had been founded on rock. And everyone who hears these words of mine and does not act on them will be like a foolish man who built his house on sand. The rain fell and the floods came, and the winds blew and beat against that house, and it fell, and great was its fall. Now when Jesus had finished saying these things, the crowds were astounded at his teaching, for he taught them as one having authority and not as their scribes. The Gospel of the Lord. Grace and peace to you from God our Creator, from Jesus Christ our Lord and Savior, and from the Holy Spirit who moves in and through us with every breath we take. Amen. If you've been with us the last couple of weeks, you know that we're still in the Sermon on the Mount. This section of the Gospel of Matthew, chapters 5 through 7, where Jesus stands on the hillside and speaks to the disciples and the crowd that gathers. And I was going to make the joke again about how Pastor Scott was old enough to be there to take the picture. And then I read today's text and I thought maybe that's being judgmental of me and I shouldn't make that joke. but I guess I just did. We're gonna pause for just a moment. Jesus certainly 
has a lot to say in the Sermon on the Mount. And you might think, wow, that's a long sermon. And I was going to joke about that, but then I realized you might feel that way every time you hear me preach. But before we get into today's text, my first question for you is, how do you know that you are loved? How have you experienced loving your life? Some of you probably immediately went back to some early memories, maybe the first time of falling in love, or a way that someone went out of their way to show you love. How many of you are familiar with Five Love Languages, the book by Gary Chapman? Seven, that's five more than first service, so you won. There are no prizes. Gary Chapman has this book that uh, I encourage all couples that we're marrying to at least familiarize themselves with. We only have one wedding on the books here at Our Saviors this year. I'll meet with that couple soon, and I'll encourage them to at least look at the five love languages. The five love languages are acts of kindness, physical touch, gifts, time, and words of affirmation. And what I tell couples after they can tell me what their love language is, is to remember that you have to communicate in your own, in your partner, not in your own, in your partner's love language. Now Anne's sitting in the back and she's like, you should listen to what you preach, Uh, right? But it's easy for us to communicate in our own love language. So for example, if your own love language is words of affirmation and you tell your partner all the time how beautiful they are and how wonderful they are and how gifted and smart they are and how much you love them, but their love language is receiving gifts and you never buy them a gift. They'll be going, how come they never tell me they love me? Because we forget to communicate in our partner's language instead of our own. But there are many ways that we come to know how loved we are. When people take time for us, when people tell us uh, positive things about us, when people are willing to hold our hand or give us a hug, when people show acts of kindness towards us. But how do you know that God loves you? How have you experienced God's love in your life? Was it through someone taking time over time to continue to tell you the message of this love that God has for you? Was it an experience, a moment? I'd be curious to hear from you. What what is your way that you know that God loves you? This seems like a weird start to a sermon on a text that starts with do not judge, but I promise we're going to get there. But first, I need you to stand as you are able. I got to preach at Rockford Lutheran Academy this week for their preschool through fifth grade chapel. And as I preached on this, I said, you know what, I'm going to tie this into this week's message. And so I'm going to invite you to repeat after me with motions and words as you are able. Ann and I go to Frankie's uh, Pilates every Friday and she always says know your own limits, right? So know your limits, don't overdo it, but as you are able, repeat after me. Ephesians, some of you don't do it, trust me, don't do it, but some of you, you could. Ephesians 3, First service had the same issue. I'm asking you to to do the motion and to say the words at the same time. I know it's complicated. It's like, you're right, but but I'm confident, right? Ephesians 3, 18. May you have the power to understand, as all God's people should, don't hit your neighbor, how wide, how long, how high, And how deep God's love really is. We could probably do better, but we'll we'll call that good for now. You can can see that. Ephesians 3.18, right? This is this letter written to the church in Ephesus that Paul writes. And we know Paul. We know that his name was Saul. We know that he was the up-and-coming Jewish religious leader who stood and held the coats of the other men as they stoned Stephen to death, the first Christian martyr. And after standing there and holding the coats as these men threw rocks, Saul says, give me the letter, give me permission to be the one to go and find and persecute these followers of the way, these followers of this Jesus of Nazareth. And he gets the permission that he needs and he heads out on this journey to arrest or even kill those who are following Jesus. But as he's on his way on this road to Damascus, he is blinded by this bright light and he hears the voice of the Lord. 
And then he goes and Ananias lays hands on him and these scales fall off of his eyes and he can see. And it is such a dramatic transformation that his name changes from Saul to Paul. And instead of the one who is out to persecute these followers of Jesus, Paul becomes the greatest missionary the world has ever known. Who dedicates his life to going and telling other about this God who loves all of us. And so Ephesians 2 starts with the verse that we stand on as Lutherans where we say, for we are saved by grace through faith in Christ alone. And then it goes into Ephesians 2.10 that we we don't know enough where it says for we are God's masterpiece created anew in Christ Jesus for the good works that God planned for us long ago you've heard me say this one many times it's the one Bible verse I have memorized right but it's a promise that each of us needs to hear I love to say you right I, I want people to look in the mirror and hear the words you are God's masterpiece but really the promise is so much greater when we hear it as we we are God's masterpiece and Paul's great message as you keep going through chapter 2 is that he realizes that this isn't a message for one group of people but this is a message for all of humanity and so Paul says this is for Jews and Gentiles this is for people everywhere I can get to as we tell them about God's love for them and so he continues to get on the boats to go and find new places so that he can tell people about God's love for them and then it leads into this prayer in chapter 3 and he starts by saying that he falls on his knees and all Awe at all that God has done and then we hear this may you have the power to understand as all God's people should how wide how long how high and how deep God's love really is for you and as people who follow Jesus a couple thousand years later really isn't that at the core of what we want we want to know that we are loved by the God of all creation by the God who has created all that is good we want to know in our own struggles today that we are loved yet we do not keep this promise for ourselves because what we really say we want as the church today is for all people to know how loved they are by this good God. This faith that we have that connects us to the triune, to the holy divine God is a faith that yes is personal but we've done an awful job in Christianity in the United States of making people think that my faith is just about me and my relationship with Jesus and nothing else matters when in reality this is about our relationship with God because everything else matters it is personal and yet it is communal it is about us and our relationship and yet it is about how we are called into community with all of God's people so as we turn to our text from Matthew chapter 7 and start at verse 1 the text says you but it's a plural you so again this is personal we need to hear that we are not to judge but this is also communal. This might help us hear the text differently. Somebody took the time to create the y'all version of scripture. And so Matthew 7, 1 and 2 says, Do not judge so that y'all will not be judged. For in the way y'all judge, y'all will be judged. And by y'all's standard of measure, it will be measured to y'all. Makes a little bit more sense now, doesn't it? Right? When it says you, we are quick to make the you a personal and to think that this is just about me. But really this is Jesus as he's standing on that mountain speaking to the disciples and to the crowds talking about this is for all of us. Those of us who hear this good news, this is what I'm telling you is that we are called into community with one another. Now... Jesus was here 2,000 years ago and people have been following ever since and so you would think that if we truly lived in this way we wouldn't even need to read this text anymore but doesn't it seem that our judgment has gotten a bit worse in the last few years like we're more divided and more quick to judge others this is where I'm preaching to myself and inviting you to just listen in because I know I'm your pastor and you think I'm perfect and holy and all that but if the world functioned the Rob James way, the world would be a much better place. It would be the utopia God dreamed of when he created us. Amen? Did, you, did, did I hear an amen? I thought I heard an amen. As we keep going, maybe this will help. This is the message translation by Eugene Peterson. As we move into the text again, it says, don't pick on people and jump on their failures and criticize their faults unless of course you want the same treatment. That critical spirit has a way of boomeranging. It's easy to see a smudge on your neighbor's face and be oblivious to the ugly sneer on your own. Do you have the nerve to say let me wash your face for you when your face is distorted by contempt? 
It's this whole traveling roadshow mentality all over again, playing a holier-than-thou part instead of just living your part. Wipe that ugly sneer off your own face, and you might be fit to offer a washcloth to your neighbor. Don't pick on people. Don't jump on their failures. Don't be quick to criticize their faults. But instead, begin with yourself. And please hear, I'm not saying look in the mirror and name all that's going wrong. Instead, I'm saying look in the mirror and see all the ways that you are loved. And let's begin by functioning out of that place of love. Have you all read Brene Brown's Braving the Wilderness yet? I used it in my sermon a couple weeks ago. A couple of you. It'll be a lot, if everyone just reads this, this will make this all a lot easier. Um, So I'll just preach on it every couple of weeks until we're all there. Brene Brown's Brave in the Wilderness, she says, dehumanization is the process by which we become accepting of violations against human nature, the human spirit, and for many of us, violations against the central tenets of our faith. There is a line, it's etched from dignity, We must never tolerate dehumanization, the primary instrument of violence that has been used in every genocide recorded throughout history and makes atrocities like slavery, torture, and human trafficking possible. When we engage in dehumanizing rhetoric or promote dehumanizing images, we diminish our own humanity in the process. If that word's new for you, go and Google it, right? But you'll understand as soon as you turn on some ads or watch the news or pay attention to what's going on around you. Dehumanization is when we look at those who we say are different from us and we start to use images of animals or something that is not human to talk about them so that we can think less of them and not feel guilty about it ourselves. We are made in the image of God, but the promise is that all of us are made in the image of God. We are God's masterpiece. That's what we just heard in Ephesians 2.10, that each of us is God's masterpiece. But when we try and take someone's humanity away from them so that we feel less guilty, really what we're giving up is part of our own humanity because we are people who've been made together in the image of God. It is communal and personal. It is about us and it is about all of us all at the same time. So if we find ourselves caught up in the things that get our attention as it talks about another person differently than us, that takes away their humanity because of how they vote or who they love or anything else in this world that we try and use to separate us. We're guilty of what Jesus talked about over 2,000 years ago. Do not judge. Simply love as you are loved. My sermon got changed for second service, all the first service people get shorted. But the golden rule we hear in this text, treat others the way that you want to be treated. But then during coffee, John Timmerwilke said, but have you heard of the platinum rule? I heard it from a pastor. He said, treat others with love. Right, this even, it's the words of Jesus, but it's still transactional if we get caught up in, well, if I want to be treated well, then I'll treat them well. And if I don't care how they treat me, then I won't care. This says simply, as you are loved, as you know how wide, how long, how high, and how deep God's love is, as you let that radiate through you, now go and love one another. No strings attached. No need for the return. No need for a response. No need for a gift. No need, just go and love because you are loved. The challenge of this is that we are to hear it and obey it. It's easy to hear it. It's implementing it that's harder. Everybody who's come before us has still struggled with it. We're still here in the church today talking about it. So how do we try and live into who we're called to be as Jesus speaks this message to us today? The one who hears it and obeys Jesus' word is one who builds their house on the rock. And when storms come crashing, the house will stand. But if we hear it and don't obey it and don't listen and don't live it out and don't let ourselves be changed so that others see God's love through us, we're like the ones who build our house on the sand. 
and the storms will come and the waves will rise and the wind will blow and the house will fall. Let's not worry about looking at what we get wrong. Let's just start with looking at how loved we are. And as you know how wide, how long, how high, and how deep God's love is, may you know it personally and live it communally. Amen. called together to follow Jesus. We pray for the church, the world, and all in need. <clears throat> Call your people to seek your wisdom in difficult conversations and actions. Give the church everywhere courage to repent for the ways we have tolerated and practiced injustice. Merciful God, receive our prayer. Inspire our wonder at creation. From the light of dawn and the beauty of the dark night, sustain the unseen depths of the ocean to the plants and animals we know well. Bring healing to lands and communities experiencing natural disasters. Merciful God, <clears throat> Instruct the powerful in your ways. Provide upright leadership in business and industry that workers are not oppressed. 
throughout the world inspire voters and raise up politicians to heed your call for nations to practice righteousness. Merciful God, receive our prayer. Loosen the bonds of injustice in our midst, grant peace to endless quarrels, put an end to hunger, and break every yoke of oppression. Shelter all who flee abuse in their homes or violence in their communities. Satisfy those afflicted in any way, especially we pray for our members. Joanna, Shirley, Betty, Gert, Fred and Lois, Ron and Carol, Kent, Dave, Dave, Jerry, Maureen, Don, Lloyd, Jody, Paula, Roger, Marie, Elizabeth, Wayne. And we pray for the family and friends of our saviors, Mary, Phyllis, Jamie, Brandon, Jerry, Dave, Phyllis, Elijah, Stephen, Frank, Tom, Mike. Merciful God, receive our prayer. Shape our congregation to be salt for the earth. Give us delight in your commandments that we are generous with those in need. Make us steadfast in our trust in you, ready with tangible mercy and compassion for our neighbors. Merciful God, receive our prayer. The cross and resurrection bring redemption from sin and death. We praise you for the, all those unshaken with faith in Christ that shines forth in their witness. Keep them in our remembrance and bring us with them into the kingdom of heaven. We especially hold in our prayer Donna and Denny Wallace and the family as they grieve the death of Donna's mom, Donna Faber. Merciful God, receive our prayer. We bring to you our needs and hopes, O God, trusting your wisdom and power revealed in Christ crucified. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Let's take a moment to share that peace.
We pray. Oh God, you give good gifts to your children simply because we ask. We now return our gifts to you in gratitude for your loving care. Bless them to your service wherever there is need. In Jesus' name, amen. Please rise as you're able. Now on the night in which he was betrayed, Lord Jesus took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and gave it to his disciples saying, take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it for all to drink, saying, this cup is a new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. And we pray as the Lord has taught us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial, save us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. At this time, if you're worshiping at home, you should gather together your elements and bring them into the place where you're worshiping and receive these words. Take and eat, this is the body of Christ given for you. Take and drink, this is the blood of Christ given for you. For us in this place, come forward and just put your hands out. We'll place a wafer in it. You can take that immediately. As you come to this, uh, uh, these small cups, the outer cups have wine in them, and the inner cups have grape juice. And you take that and you'll see a basket at the end of each of the lines where you can place that cup in. Christ invites us to the table. Come taste and see. Please be seated. Thank you. 
that light. <laughs> it's really bright. We pray. God of the abundant table, you have refreshed our hearts in this meal with bread for the journey. Give us your grace on the road that we might serve our neighbors with joy for the sake of Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And receive the blessing. God who gives life to all things and frees them from despair, bless you with truth and peace. And may the Holy Trinity, one God, guide you always in faith, hope, and love. Amen. Before we sing our last song, just some announcements to highlight. It is really bright, and I'm not going to complain because I like that the sun is shining. Uh, some announcements to highlight, whether you got these in person or online or email. Uh, as you look at this, um, first off, annual meeting, we'll talk about in just a minute. As soon as this service ends, we'll lock the door so none of you can leave, and we'll go straight into our annual meeting. We'll have a quorum. It'll be great. Uh, no, if you need to go, we understand, but uh, right after this service, 1130, we'll be starting our annual meeting. So if you're a member, certainly hope you'll stick around and vote. But even if you're not a member of our Saviors yet, hope you'll stick around just to hear a recap of what has been as we look to where, we're, our, where we are going. Um, our mission of the month this month is RPS's Fairview Early Childhood Center, less than a mile from here. Our missions cabinet is working on, there are lots of great organizations uh, in Rockford and around the world. And it's awesome that we can often send a check and be a blessing. We're looking at ways we can be partners. And so we've reached out to begin conversation to say, how can we partner with Fairview Early Childhood Center? And they said right now, one of their needs is to replace or repair some of their climbing wall equipment. You can imagine a school full of preschoolers in the middle of winter. It'd be good for them to get out some physical activity. And so Again, our mission of the month is always an above and beyond, right? Our regular offering goes to the ministry we're called into together, and these mission of the month are opportunities to say, if this is something you're passionate about and have the means, we invite you to contribute to, to help out these partners. And so you can uh, contribute th online or in person to the mission of the month. Uh, we are going bowling today, three to five up Park Lanes. Not too late to sign up, but please sign up so we can plan. $10 per person gets you food and bowling and shoes. Uh, and it's $30 per household max. So sign up at the information center. Let us know quick if you're coming. But would love, if you got nothing else uh, planned, come and join us and be a part of uh, just a fun afternoon together. Our WELCA, our Women of the ELCA, has a great uh, conversation coming up this Tuesday night at 6 uh, on the state of mental health today. Uh, this is open to everyone, don't have to be women or men, and don't have to be members. So invite friends. Uh, I know we've got a good crowd signed up. Don't need to register, but if you can, that'll let us plan accordingly for refreshments, but plan on being here Tuesday at 6 o'clock. Trivia night, Friday night, to support our senior high youth trip. Who's already signed up? So I'm just going to tell you now, the winning team gets 100 grand. So not a lie, winning team gets 100 grand. I would encourage you, you can either sign up by yourself with a team of eight or anywhere in between. You need to sign up by today so we can plan and be ready for Friday night. $15 gets you a pasta buffet dinner and the fun entertainment of trivia night and access to the silent auction items. So all you need to do is sign up. You'll pay at the event uh, on Friday night. So get registered and come and be a part of that fun. Friends are welcome, right? Doesn't have to be members of our saviors. If you've got friends that like a good night or good trivia, bring them out. You can look ahead the next couple of weeks, just lots of opportunities for our junior high and high school youth for second Sunday with other area ELCA churches. Our Romeo, I gotta make sure I say this right, right retired our saviors men, not retired old men, but retired our saviors men eating out, but eating here. So uh, we brought that back this year, and so excited to welcome men to come and have lunch and some learning. Um, Rooted is open to everyone, our third Wednesday, time of dinner and gathering and learning and fellowship. So come on out for Rooted and classic movie coming. Uh, also highlight that uh, if you know somebody with a preschooler in the fall, uh, let them know that Playtown has open houses, and we would love to see them here at Playtown. You've all done a fabulous job of supporting Playtown, and things are going really well, and would love to welcome some more new friends this fall. So if you know somebody looking for a preschool, let them know to send them to Playtown. Uh, just a clarification is Lent is coming quickly. February 22nd is Ash Wednesday, and we'll begin our season of Lent, leading us up to Holy Week and Easter. On February 22nd, Ash Wednesday, We'll have a brief noon service, a 30-minute service or so. We'll do the, the marking of the ashes. There's no communion at the noon service. 
We'll then go, those who want to stay, Pastor Scott's going to lead us through a class through Lent on The Jesus I Never Knew by Philip Yancey. So we'll go grab soup lunch and immediately begin the class afterwards. So it's not a just come and hang out and have lunch. It's grab lunch and have the class. Uh, But sign up so we know how many are coming. 6.30 on Ash Wednesday, we'll have a full service with ashes and communion. The rest of Lent, the noontime, we'll have this space open from 11 to 2 with a handout and some soft music to guide you and some personal time of prayer and and meditation and reflection. Uh, And we'll have the the luncheon and the class from noon to 1.30, 2 o'clock. Uh, There won't be a noon service per se, uh, but then 6.30 every Wednesday of Lent, we'll gather for uh, the evening vespers. If you open your hymnal in front of you and find the evening vespers service, just a beautiful uh, meditative, music-heavy, quiet service for us to do some focus and some prayer and and, uh, sing together. So we'd love to see you for those other stuff in there, but I'll stop now so we can sing and then get our annual meeting started. Please rise. with Christ beside you. Thanks be to God.